Just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. I'm a, a biomedical physician out here in Southern California. I've been in practice now for over 11 years. I've uh, been part of the Defeat Autism Now organization, which actually has its headquarters uh, through the Autism Research Institute in San Diego, which is about 60 miles south of where I live and practice. Uh, and I've been doing these uh, biomedical webinars with Great Plains now for a couple of years. Um, do try to do a lot of uh, you know parent education, physician education. Um, you know, have done webinars, have done seminars around the country, um, and so I really try to get the information out to you folks so that you've got things at your fingertips, um, whether it's learning about methyl B12 or learning about chelation therapy or hyperbaric oxygen therapy or how to treat yeast problems. There's so many facets to biomedical intervention. It's not just one thing. And what I've often found through medical education um, is that there's a lot of things that people are confused about, whether it's terminology, whether it's about specific concepts, whether it's about how to do something, um, you know, it's great to be able to go to a conference and listen to doctors talking about a lot of research and, you know, the, the latest techniques. But if you come away from that conference without really having any idea about what to do first, um, then a lot of the information sort of falls flat and you never really get going with anything. So my goal with tonight's presentation was to try to touch on a few things that I have found in my clinical practice a lot of people tend to be confused about. Whether it is a terminology, whether it is a specific type of concept, I figured what I did is I sat down and made a list of like the top 10 things that people come to me uh, and tend to re ask me over and over and over again that they're just not clear about. And so, you know, this was a list I created, you know, from my own experience in practice. I'm almost guaranteed to have missed something. So, I'm, you know, like any type of presentation, I'll never be able to touch on every aspect of biomedical concepts, definitions, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, we may have to do another part two maybe in the future um, as we sort of update information and move forward. So let, with that, let's go ahead and get started. What I touched on, what I'm going to touch on tonight is I'm going to talk about sort of six major categories. And I'm going to talk a little bit about diet and where some of the confusion comes, just even within understanding the gluten casing for diet and other aspects of, of dietary intervention. I'm going to talk about a few things with respect to supplements, the digestive system, um, what this biochemical system is called methylation, immune function, <clears throat> and in the end, we will touch on uh, a little bit about chelation therapy. So what I want to just kind of point out to you is that, you know, my intent with this presentation wasn't to go real in-depth into all of these different categories. I mean, we'd be here all night. Um, you know, for example, chelation therapy. I mean, that, that in and of itself is an entire presentation. But I just want to kind of hit on certain key concepts and maybe just clear up some confusion for you um, at least from the way that I practice and how I've seen, you know, biomedical therapies work uh, for many, many families. If you didn't know, Dr. Shaw has a new book, Dr. Shaw from Great Plains. Um, this just came out, and I just got my copy, actually. Um, nice book called Autism Beyond the Basics, and you can go to greatplainslaboratory.com and look under their bookstore, and you can order this book there, and you'll see... Um, contribution is a number of different doctors and I'm actually one of the contributors to this book. I have a chapter in this book that sort of lays out um, some different aspects to biomedical intervention of what a typical child who's regressed into the autism spectrum looks like and some different types of things you can consider. I've also recently written a book on methyl B12 therapy and this is very very specific for methyl B12 injection therapy. Um, I've had a few people come back and say, well, what about, you know, nasal spray or what about the powder or the cream or the lollipops? And I'll touch on that a little bit later in this presentation. This is a how-to guide with respect to implementing methyl B12 injection therapy from everything from what you need to know to the biochemistry to what to look for to the benefits to the side effects to how to access it to how to dose it. So it's a very comprehensive book. You can go to methylb12forautism.com um, and get a copy there if you want to learn more about that. And I also, if for those of you, maybe this is your first time listening to me, um, didn't realize that I have 
a biomedical education uh, intervention website called autismactionplan.org. Uh, and there's a free ebook you can get there as well, okay? And what you can do is just go to that homepage at autismactionplan.org, um, enter your name and email, and you can get this free ebook, um, which kind of gives just a, a, a basic overview of biomedical intervention. You know, everything from, you know, things with like talking about B12 and yeast problems and gut problems. So this is a nice thing. Uh, Maybe some of you who've been doing this for a while, you don't need basic information, but it's also a nice book maybe to give to a friend or give to a skeptical family member, um, maybe even your doctor, you know, who you're trying to work with. You know, if you live in an area where you don't have a lot of medical support, um, it's a nice book you might be able to kind of give their way and have them read that. Um, and that's also the whole point of the website. You know, the Autism Action Plan website is a very interactive website. There's protocols and lecture material and video presentations and instructional, instructional videos, as well as a very active parent forum, which I am actively involved in on a day-to-day on a -day basis, sometimes three to four times a day, answering questions from people all over the country and all over the world with respect to their, to their child. And we also have a video chat, which means uh, twice a week you can go onto the website, and I am there live, and you can ask questions. Um, and I do that twice a week. And we also have a speech and feeding therapist by the name of Don Winkleman, who's involved in the video chat as well, talking about everything from, you know, how to get your kids to take supplements to what's the difference between a picky eater and a problem eater, different techniques with respect to, to feeding issues, um, what are some things you have to consider with respect to speech therapy. So a whole wide uh, variety of different type of information that, that Don provides. And of course, with my 11 plus years now of biomedical background, just being able to kind of give you, you know, my take on things and my experience. So a lot of people find it uh, very, very helpful as a supplemental part for their child's care and for ongoing education. And then one more book. Um, as you can see, I'm really into books. Um, obviously, it's, there's a lot of information out there. But if you don't have this book, I'd really encourage you to get it. This was one of the first books that I read um, way back when, when I first started getting into biomedical intervention. This was a this is a this book has been updated since the version I had, but it's a it's a really good book from that Dr. Shaw put out because he he does an excellent job talking about the complexities of yeast and bacteria, um, how some of the gut related issues, the dietary issues can interfere and interact with brain chemistry. So a good book, there's a lot of good books out there, obviously, uh, but I, I, I do like Dr. Shaw's information and the way that he presents information in a no-nonsense fashion. Okay, let's talk a little bit here about some of the issues with respects to diet. Um, we obviously know diet is a big factor in biomedical intervention. There's all kinds of diets out there. And I'm sure many of you out there probably have your kids on one diet or another. Or maybe you've transitioned from a gluten casein-free to a specific carbohydrate or a gluten casein-free to a low oxalate. You're trying to include some anti-yeast or maybe doing a few things with respect to no phenols. And so, you know, diet, again, could be an entire evening of lectures because it is a very complex um, and comprehensive topic that needs to be explored. But there are some things that tend to be confusing to people. And what I want to do here is just kind of give you a few ideas. First off is what is gluten and casein? Okay. Um, is it the chemical structure of these foods that tends to dictate its physiological effects in the body? And it truly is. What is this thing called the peptide effect? Okay. And what are peptides? And then how would a gluten casein reaction differ from, say, a typical food allergy, okay? Um, and what are some things that you need to know with respect to that? Well, we know that the gluten casein-free diet has been around for a long, long time. If you look at the statistics from the Autism Research Institute, they have ranked the gluten casein-free diet. I guess, I guess I should say parents have actually ranked the gluten casein-free diet as a very highly effective therapy for a good 60 to 65 percent of the kids um, when compared to other therapies like drug therapy or certain supplement therapy. So we know it's a tried and true remedy. And my feeling is is that all kids should be put on a gluten casein-free diet at least some point, um, ideally for six months, maybe even just three months, to see what kind of effects they get. Gluten 
is a specific protein that's found in things like wheat, um, barley, rye, spelt, kamut, and sometimes oats. Now, there's a specific subfraction um, of a protein found specifically in wheat that's called gliadin. And when you're talking about looking at somebody who actually has celiac disease, um, which is a genetic problem with respect to digesting gluten, they actually carry what are called anti-gliadin antibodies, which means they're very reactive specifically to gliadin. There are other subfractions that are similar to gliadin that are found in barley, rye, in rye and spelt, etc., that aren't exactly gliadin. Chemically, they're a little bit different, but they have a very similar physiological effect in the body. So basically, um, there's a lot of what we call cross-reactivity with these food proteins. Casein is specific to dairy. Now, the, the thing that we're seeing with most kids on the spectrum is that the particular chemical structure of casein in cow dairy um, seems to be different than, let's say, goat. So we know that kids who may be cow dairy intolerant um, sometimes can actually use goat milk or goat cheese and not have a problem because the casein content is a little bit different. So when we're generally talking about casein intolerance, we're, we're generally referring to cow dairy. Okay. And what are some of the clinical benefits seen? Well, you know, better, better bowel function, um, improved skin tone, maybe that's you know, just improvement in skin tone in general, less rashes, eczema for example. Um, but some other kind of unique things happen too. And that is, sometimes kids start to develop more of a, uh, I guess you call it an acceptable or normal pain tolerance, which means that their, their body starts to feel pain in a more normal way. And I've seen this with kids where they can burn themselves or they can you know, hurt themselves pretty, pretty bad, where another child might be crying or, or become you know, quite agitated. Um, sometimes kids on the spectrum who have the, the gluten and the casein issues um, seem to have a high pain tolerance. <clears throat> Many times you can see decreased self-injurious behavior, eye contact, focusing, attention, etc. can can improve with the gluten casein-free diet. And as I mentioned before, you know, a trial diet, ideally with no no infractions, 100%, for at least three months, ideally six months, um, is a good thing to try to implement. Now I realize it's not always easy, but you know that 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 whole topic about sort of how to do the diet is another another lecture, but we know that the gluten casein for diet is very, very helpful. Well, what is happening chemically? And what are some things I think that are important to kind of understand here? <clears throat> gluten and casein have a very specific uh, amino acid sequence. And this, as you see here, this amino acid sequence of tyrosine, proline, glycine, etc., um, is very unique. And these this chemical structure is very similar to morphine. So this is why these things are called glutamorphine or casomorphine, is because those, those amino acid chains in that specific peptide sequence um, has an opiate effect in the body, or can be if these things are absorbed in very large amounts. There's a very, very unique thing that happens when uh, somebody who's very sensitive to gluten and casein, when they eat these things, um, what can happen chemically. Proline, which is amino acid at the second position, there's an enzyme called DPP4, dipeptidyl peptidase. And dipeptidyl peptidase, you know, for this discussion, is a specific enzyme in the gut that helps to digest these particular peptides. Okay? And what it's doing is it's cleaving this amino acid chain, or this what's called a peptide chain, at that proline second position. And what happens is, is you get a situation where you have a tyrosine and a proline are cleaved off from the rest of that sequence. Now, normally that would be uh, viewed as a good thing because the enzyme is doing what it's supposed to do. The problem is, is that when the DPP4 goes after the second proline segment, um, that process actually flows back and inhibits DPP4 from further activity. So in essence, what's going on here is that when there's a problem in this mechanism and in the inability to digest these things appropriately, the DPP4, through its own inherent activity of, of breaking down these gluto, these casomorphine and gluto, uh, casomorphine and, excuse me, these glutomorphine and casomorphine structures, is the enzyme ends up committing suicide. Okay, and what happens is, is you get these partially digested peptide chains that are now being absorbed 
into the bloodstream and they can, in a neurologically sensitive individual, start to interfere with brain chemistry. And that's kind of the whole point of this. So we know that the gluten casein-free diet um, can help in just lowering these morphine-like or opiate-like chemicals that come from these particular types of foods. <clears throat> now, why is that important? Well, as I mentioned before, the, the glutamorphine and the casomorphine can have a blunting effect on pain response or it can interfere with attention and focusing or it might be it causes a, a behavioral problem of irritability agitation. Okay? <clears throat> That, in essence, when you have a situation where chemically the gluten and the casein or the opiates structure of those proteins is having a chemical effect on the brain, um, you're getting what's called a drug-like effect. So kids are having many times a drug-like effect due to the gluten and casein, or what I call the peptide effect. And that can be anything from, as I mentioned, the blunting of pain to irritability to poor eye contact, you know, lack of speech, whatever it may be. Okay, that in and of itself is not truly a food allergy or even really a food sensitivity. It's truly a chemical problem due to the inability to properly digest and metabolize that food. Okay, so one of the benefits of the gluten casein free diet is it has a uh, it can have a benefit and re at reducing a drug like effect from those foods. And typically, in many kids who are very sensitive to it, they can actually go through a bit of a withdrawal. When you p take that food away from them, they can become quite agitated and irritable. Um, I've had some kids who you know, had headaches and were sweating and were nauseous, almost like their body was going through a withdrawal, similar to what you would get if you were addicted to morphine. Okay? <clears throat> well, what are some other types of food reactions? We also know that you can develop, in this example, to gluten and casein, a food IgG reaction. Um, and an IgG reaction, I'll touch on this a little bit more when we get to the immune system part, but IgG is a hypersensitivity. It's a sensitivity within the immune system <clears throat> to the specific proteins found in gluten and casein. Excuse me there, I had a, my voice is getting dry already. Um, <clears throat> So we have the food IgG test, which is a test that identifies for IgG immune reactions. <clears throat> okay, that by definition is not a true allergy. A true allergy is when the body produces IgE. IgE is the allergy chemical, if you will, that is circulating in very low amounts in the body and becomes stimulated when we are having a type of an allergic reaction. And this is that histamine response. In a classic standpoint, you would get, uh, you might get hives, your lips might become swollen, you get itchy eyes, runny nose. Um, that is a true allergy, and that type of reaction usually occurs very quickly, sometimes within minutes of consuming a particular type of food. <clears throat> if you think about it, We've often heard of people who have shellfish allergies or they react violently to peanuts. Okay? For most of us, um, we're, you know, or most of the kids that I've evaluated, don't have a lot of IgE reactions, but many times they have a lot of IgG reactions. IgG is more of a delayed onset. It can sometimes happen with hours to days. And it may or may not be tied to some type of behavioral problem. Um, many times it's more of a physical issue. Sometimes it can be bloating or gas or loose stools, um, <clears throat> or it just may be an overall weakness in the immune system. Um, if a child has a lot of IgG reactions, that sets them up for um, vulnerability to bacterial or viral infections, where they just become, their immune system becomes preoccupied with all these IgG reactions. In adults, sometimes a lot of IgG reactions can lead to joint pain um, or sometimes even low-level swelling in the joints or just fatigue or brain fog. Okay, I don't have too many kids coming back telling me they're having joint pain, um, but you can see here that it's more of a low-level inflammation of the body, whereas the IgE reaction is more of a true allergy that can happen quite quickly. <clears throat> okay, so we have the drug-like effect to the gluten and the casein. We can also have a food sensitivity, IgG, to the gluten and the casein, 
And I think theoretically you could have an IgE, a true allergy to gluten and casein, although that's not real, real common. Okay. Then we have these other types of food reactions, things called phenols or salicylates. And essentially the way to just think about these are they're, they're not really involving the immune system so much, um, but it's just an intolerance to a chemical or a group of chemicals in those foods. You know, the phenols, um, you know, things like artificial colors or artificial flavors, you know, dark fruits or certain vegetables might cause a phenol reaction, hyperactivity, irritability, agitation, headaches, etc. Okay, and you, those are usually short, um, they have a short onset, I should not short onset, but they can have a quick onset as well. Um, that Jekyll or Hyde phenomena that you see with some kids when they eat um, something like a food dye and they become very agitated, very irritable, very hyper in a very short period of time. That is tends to be more of a phenol type of reaction. It's not, like I said, it's not so much of a, an immune system problem. So a couple things, hopefully that kind of just clears that up a little bit. I know there's always more questions with respects to that, but I just wanted to touch a little bit on the aspects of food and food reactions. Now supplements, and as, again, we could spend all night talking about supplements, but a few things that I see in my practice that a lot of people are confused about, and I'm sure maybe some people out there have some questions about this too, <clears throat> and it specifically deals with probiotics, okay? And there's a whole list of probiotics um, that we're using in our practices. Well, the bottom line is that probiotics are essentially beneficial bacteria for digestive health, okay? And if we think about an example of probiotics, from new beginnings, they carry something called probiotic support formula or Therabiotic Complete, which is a product from Claire. If you look at the label, you know, it's going to be a, a list of things of, of different types of acidophilus and bifidobacter bacteria, okay, which are the two predominant types of normal bacterial species in the digestive system. <clears throat> And so those are what I call multi-spectrum or multi-floral probiotics. They're basically just giving bacterial support to the digestive system, almost like you think of it like a multivitamin for the gut, okay? Well, we also have other bacterial probiotics, and there's actually a yeast probiotic um, out there called Saccharomyces boulardii. A specific type of bacterial probiotic might be something called culturel which is a, just a specific type of acidophilus. Saccharomyces boulardii is actually a yeast that fights candida. Okay, so it's an, it basically you think of it like an anti-yeast yeast. It, you know, is it a classically uh, a probiotic? I mean, probiotic is something that promotes life. Um, <clears throat> could you, can you survive without Saccharomyces boulardii? Sure, okay, Saccharomyces boulardii, is not a normal inhabitant of our digestive system. It's not something that colonizes our digestive tract long term or would really lead to a disease process in our body, uh, but it's something that we can take as a supplement to help fight off yeast and sometimes fight off bad bacteria. <clears throat> but it is a yeast, okay? And then there are, there are those probiotics that are more targeted therapies, okay? As I mentioned before, the therabiotic or the probiotic support formula as an example, is a multifloral probiotic for just overall general bowel health and overall physical health. We then have Culturel, which you could think of as a specific treatment-oriented probiotic specifically to Clostridia bacteria. <clears throat> and Clostridia bacteria is a big problem we see with kids. 3LAC is another example of a treatment-specific probiotic, many times used specifically to fight yeast. Okay, as I mentioned before, Saccharomyces boulardii, now this is not a bacteria, this is actually a yeast, but it does have an effect at attacking candida as well as clostridia, so it has kind of a dual effect. But again, it's very treatment specific. And then VSL-3 is an, another example of a probiotic, and this one is generally given to help with oxalate problems. Okay, oxalates are these compounds found in many different types of foods that can lead to kidney stones and mineral issues in the body. So VSL-3 is very specific. So the thing to keep in mind about the probiotics is you have the, the multiflora probiotics which just support general health and then very specific targeted probiotics that you use for a specific purpose. Well, what about medications and probiotics? Um, <clears throat> another area that 
tends to be uh, confusing a lot of people is sometimes the differences between these these antifungals and and whether to take them or not to take them with probiotics. Nystatin, Diflucan, Nizerol, I'll touch on that a little bit more a little bit later. All of these are antifungals, okay? Um, and ideally, they, <clears throat> they should be taken at least 60 minutes, maybe even 90 minutes apart from, let's say, Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a specific yeast. However, if you're using a probiotic like Therabiotic Complete or Culturel, um, you don't have to worry about the antifungals because those are bacterial probiotics. <clears throat> these, these medications are anti-yeast or antifungal. They're not antibacterial. So generally, if you're using a bacterial-based probiotic, you know, in most cases, you can take it right along with these antifungals and it's not going to have a harmful effect. However, if you're using Saccharomyces boulardii or Saccharomyces boulardii is part of a combination probiotic they're using, then yeah, it should be separated because the Saccharomyces boulardii is a yeast and these things are anti-yeast and they will basically uh, eradicate or at least diminish the effectiveness. Now, what about antibiotics? Okay. There's a whole laundry list of antibiotics, from flagell to vancomycin to alinea to amoxicillin to augmentin, et cetera. Okay? Antibiotics are antibacterial, and they should not be taken at the same time as a classic bacterial probiotic. Probiotic support formula, Therabiotic Complete, VSL3, Colgerel are examples. The only difference here with the bacteria, the antibiotics, is Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a yeast, will not be affected by them. Matter of fact, they've actually used Saccharomyces boulardii um, in people taking antibiotics to actually try to prevent candida overgrowth. <clears throat> okay, so again, the antibiotics are specific to bacteria. Um, they're not going to have an effect on a probiotic yeast. Well, what about some of the other types of supplements? Herbal products, um, other supplements that are effective against bacteria and yeast. I, I mean, really, generally, the, the same principle applies, you know, for the most part. Um, you know, ideally, things should be separated out if you can, you know, an hour, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, if possible. I realize that's not always possible. I realize sometimes the timing of things can be difficult to achieve. Um, you know, you're trying to avoid giving, you know, supplements, you know, five, six times a day. And uh, it's difficult to say, you know, for sure how much of an effect something like grapefruit seed extract or oil of oregano or caprylic acid might have on a probiotic. Um, I think you can pretty much figure out that it's probably going to have some effect. Um, it might reduce the potency 20, 25 percent. Um, difficult to say in general. So my, my, my up, the upshot is, is if you can separate them, I'd recommend doing so. If it's very difficult to do, um, and maybe you're only able to separate them by a half hour or whatever, then you know, move forward with your programs. To me, the most important thing is to get these supplements into your kids. Um, if they're just sitting on the kitchen counter or sitting in the refrigerator not being used, they're not doing any good. So if you're reducing the potency of a probiotic by 25, 30, 40 percent, well, you're still getting you know, a good 50, 60 percent effectiveness from that probiotic. I realize they're expensive, but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do to get the job done. Okay, a lot of discussion about probiotics and digestive enzymes, <clears throat> and information has kind of gone, gone back and forth on this. Some people feel like absolutely you need to separate them from digestive enzymes. Other people felt like you pretty much don't. I think some of the latest information that I've seen is that many of these digestive enzymes are very specific for food proteins. They're not really digesting the cell wall of, you know, bacterial or yeast. Um, <clears throat> organisms or yeast probiotics. So I think for the most part, it, you're probably pretty safe if you have to, giving the probiotics at a, with a meal where you may be using some digestive enzymes. Again, you may be getting a slight reduction in potency, but you know the consistency over time is what's important. Um, and I haven't really seen you know a, an adverse effect in, in doing it that way. There is an example of an exception to that, and that is a specific type of enzyme called Candex. Candex is a an anti. You can think of it as an anti-candida enzyme, <clears throat> and it definitely attacks the cell wall of candida. 
So if you are using Saccharomyces boulardii, probably best to separate those two um, and not use them at the same time um, because you may just be breaking down the cell wall of Saccharomyces like you would Candida and not getting the effectiveness and the enzyme being left over to attack the Candida. The other thing about Candex, because it is an enzyme, um, you don't you want to try to take it on an empty stomach, okay? Because if you give it with food, it's just going to digest the food and not really do anything to the yeast. All right, and then finally, it leaves us with just some general rules with respect to supplements. There's all kinds of rules out there about you know don't take this with this, and you got to do this at a certain time, and before you know it, you know you're, you're, you're so paralyzed to do anything, um, you're hardly giving your kids supplements at all, or you're not getting any sleep, okay? And you know a, a few things that are important. Calcium should not be taken with zinc. So if you can separate those two, that's ideal. Um, <clears throat> whether you give maybe zinc at the evening and calcium in the morning or give calcium with dinner and zinc near bedtime, but probably separate them out by, you know, an hour and a half, two hours would be ideal. Also, it's best to avoid, if your child is taking copper, to avoid copper and zinc together because they do tend to compete with each other for absorption. Um, the other thing is um, zinc particularly should be taken with a small amount of food. So if you're giving your child zinc, um, probably best to have a little food in their, in their belly because zinc can cause some nausea. Um, for the most part though, you know, most of these vitamins can be mixed together. I haven't found any major, you know, interaction between a multivitamin or a probiotic or, um, you know, an enzyme and taking it with vitamins. Um, they generally things tend to mix, mix well together pretty well and they usually mix well in either food or juice. So the bottom line here is just getting this stuff into your kids' bodies. That ultimately is the is the goal. Uh, did I miss something? Let me go back real quick. Yeah, that was it. All right, let's talk a little bit about the digestive system. Um, big topic again, and you know, just to kind of orient you here, when we're talking about the gut, we really this picture doesn't show the mouth, but the mouth is really the beginning. It is the beginning stages of our digestive tract. Through the process of chewing, we secrete. Um, digestive enzymes and saliva that help to break the food down and it passes through the esophagus into the stomach and that stomach is an area that's churning food, releasing hydrochloric acid, getting that food broken down um, significantly so that when it passes into the small intestine, the pancreas which is releasing secretin and releasing digestive enzymes starts to act upon that food and as that food starts to move its way down through the digestive tract from the duodenum <coughs> to the jejunum to the ileum, um, nutrients are being absorbed into the body and by the time you hit the ileum which is the last part of the small intestine it's a place that's the most immunologically active um, part of the digestive tract an area that many times is commonly inflamed for kids um, <clears throat> but it's an area of a tremendous immune activity um, most of the time by the time you reach the ileum ideally most of the nutrients should be taken from the food and found their way into the bloodstream and then that food stuff or that leftover material is then taken into the large intestine where there's a whole plethora of different bacteria acting upon that. Um, you start to reabsorb water and essentially the stool just becomes more bulky and then is eventually excreted you know, as fecal matter. <clears throat> okay, so that's just sort of a quick overview of the, of the gut. And we get into trouble in many respects along the way. This is an image here of the surface lining of the digestive tract. And as you can see here, the mucosal lining is these finger-like projections. And each of these little boxes <clears throat> could be a different type of cell. This might be an immune cell. This might be a digestive cell. This might be something that's absorbing nutrients. And then we have these finger-like, these, these hair-like structures on the fingers that are these cilia. This is what kind of passes food you know, through the digestive tract and there's a stimulating aspect with respect to bacteria and, and yeast and whatnot that are in the gut. And you have to imagine these finger-like projections just being embedded in this layer of mucus, <clears throat> okay? One of the problems that can happen with chronic yeast problems or bacterial problems or even parasites is they can get trapped down here in these little crypts. And if you have long-standing inflammation, sometimes these finger-like projections can collapse on each other and you get pockets of infection that can just fester and fester and fester. Uh, it's very difficult for the immune system to, to get, get at them and eradicate. Okay? But basically here, the digestive tract is very complex in what we absorb and the overall immune function of what the whole gut is all about. Now, leaky gut is something that a lot of people talk about. 
they're worried about it with respect to their kids and, and uh, deservedly so. And essentially what leaky gut is, is we're getting food and pathogen toxins that are being absorbed and infiltrating across the lining of the gut and many times moving into the bloodstream or the lymphatic um, circulation and then taken to the blood um, almost sometimes fully intact. And so let's go back to this picture here. If you take a look at some of these squares and you see this little dark line in between, if these dark lines start to open up, okay, I don't have a picture here of leaky gut, but just imagine that these spaces start to open up and you start getting toxins that, that are now flowing into the bloodstream and the lymphatic system intact, you're going to have a big problem. Okay, and leaky gut can lead to you know, systemic inflammation, um, immune activation, increased sensitivity to allergies, increased food sensitivities, um, increased engagement of the immune system, which can lead to overall inflammation, not only gut inflammation, but blood inflammation and essentially brain inflammation too can happen from leaky gut. And there's all the other toxins that get produced as well. Okay, So leaky gut essentially is that. Well, you also have inflammation in the gut, and sometimes inflammation can be difficult to evaluate for, although you might be suspicious that it's there. You know, a couple markers that show up on some of the tests that I've done, which is the comprehensive digestive stool analysis, is lysozyme and lactoferrin. Lysozyme is more of a, um, it's like a, a, a surface level inflammation that can occur, you know, because of even just, let's say, immune activity against a new bacteria or a new, you know, yeast problem or an overgrowth problem in the gut. Lactoferrin tends to be a little bit more specific for localized inflammation in the digestive tract, although it can be triggered by an acute infection too, lactoferrin being something that many times is measured for somebody who actually has inflammatory bowel disease. So those are two markers that you can look for that, that indicate inflammation. Just because those tests are normal on a stool test doesn't mean there couldn't be a leaky gut situation or there couldn't be some low-level inflammation. It just didn't show up to any significant degree on the stool test. One of the things you'll also see on a stool analysis is the secretory IgA. I'll touch on this a little bit more when we get to the immune system part, but the secretory IgA is the, is the main immune chemical in the digestive tract embedded itself in that mucus layer, um, and it has a, 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 a tremendous regulatory control over immunity in the gut as well as systemic immunity throughout our body. One of the other com, uh, complicating factors to ongoing problems with kids is chronic yeast and bacterial issues. And I've seen kids in my practice where we treated for yeast and bacteria. The parents are doing all kinds of supplements. They're doing the diet, et cetera, et cetera. And we just can't get things under control. Okay. Well, one, one thing that may be happening with, with your child, um, if this is the case, is, is uh, something called biofilms. And we'll touch on biofilms here. I just want to go back real quickly. When you, when you look at some of these images of biofilms, just imagine we're looking at this picture here and maybe you've got a biofilm that is embedding itself through these finger-like projections and down in these small crypts. And if you've got a biofilm that's embedding itself in a crypt that is now inflamed and it's collapsing on itself, that could be a, a hidden pocket of, of chronic infection and inflammation um, that can many times take, be a difficult thing to get rid of um, if you're not you know, addressing specifically the biofilm. Okay, let's touch on that a little bit more. Okay, first, before we talk about the biofilms real quickly, let me just kind of define for you a little bit about um, yeast. A lot of people say, well, what is yeast and what is fungus and what are molds, etc." The biological group of organisms that yeast, mold, and mushrooms fall in is called fungi, okay? Candida and Saccharomyces are specific yeasts. Molds, a, a specific type of mold, um, is aspergillus, which many times is found in house plants, in soil around your home. If you live in an area that's quite moist, um, you can get aspergillus overgrowth in moldy food. And there are other molds, you know, stocky botrys and cladosporium or other types of toxic molds that can cause immune problems, immune sensitivities. And of course, we have mushrooms. <clears throat> when we're specifically talking about candida, um, <clears throat> candida 
generally exist in multiple different forms. We have the singled cell form, which is sort of the, the form that it kind of hangs out in. You're always going to have some yeast in your body, some candida in your digestive tract. You're never going to get rid of it 100%. And if it's just kind of hanging out by itself, not causing a problem, you know, everybody's happy. Okay, your immune system's taking control of it, the other bacteria are taking control of it, so it's not an issue. Well, there's another form called mycelium, which is the colony. And this is when yeast start to come together and form colonies. And I often make the analogy about yeast is a single cell candida is like a dog in your neighborhood that gets out periodically and runs around to the different neighbor's house and doesn't really cause much of a problem. Um, and it, it just sort of exists by itself. However, if that dog were to get out and that dog were to come together with, a, with other dogs in the neighborhood and they packed together, that nice sweet little dog okay can take on the pack mentality and become aggressive and invasive to that neighborhood and this is something i saw in my undergraduate uh, college up in northern california where when the, at the end of the year the college students would leave <clears throat> many times they'd throw their cats and their dogs in the, the huge central local park they had there and they started getting packs of dogs running wild um, and these things became quite dangerous. Okay, so when yeast start to colonize, they start to change form, and they start to take on a mentality of wanting to become more invasive. <clears throat> you also have other things like cyst-like forms, or what's called cell wall deficient forms, um, that yeast take on. But essentially, it's the mycelium and the cyst-like form of yeast that cause it to start to invade the tissue of the gut and can become invasive throughout the body. And this image right here is just showing that. It's showing a yeast that is starting to invade itself into tissue. <clears throat> and then this image right here, again, you see these, this colony of yeast, and then it starts to grow these, these arms um, as it's starting to extend itself out and becoming more invasive, almost like a a weed starts to grow deeper and deeper roots into your lawn. Okay, well, biofilms is um, it's a it's a it's an entity that exists in nature. They figure about 98, 99 percent of all bacteria and yeast actually live in a state of biofilm, and it's a big problem in uh, water engineering, essentially water treatment facilities, because these biofilms can grow. Um, and actually, you know, be a contamination source um, for water treatment plants. We know that in hospital settings, biofilms are being looked at more now as a source of secondary infections or ongoing infections in the hospital because bacteria can form these biofilms that stick themselves to, um, you know, countertops or metal or plastic or catheters or tubing. Um, and you can see where it could be a big problem in a hospital as a, as a source of infection. Well, the biofilm technology, at least with yeast, is, is used um, in the advantage of things like winemaking. Okay, and this is an example here where you see this uh, on this, this uh, image B, where you see a biofilm actually accumulating. And it's an area that um, is, is alive. It's, it's metabolically alive. Um, the, the, in this case, the yeast thrive in that particular area because it's a way for the yeast to, to get the nutrients they need. It's a way for the yeast to communicate with each other. So biofilm certainly has a purpose in, um, in, in sometimes in food manufacturing and in this case wine manufacturing. Um, but it can be a problem um, in our body. Okay? And as I mentioned before, you, know, you can have normal yeast that start to spread its tentacles here and become more invasive um, as it becomes more pathogenic. And this is just an example here of a candida biofilm um, basically splaying itself out along a catheter and plastic. Okay, so again, if you think about the hospital setting with all the equipment and other things they do to take care of patients, um, you know, the bacterial biofilms and yeast biofilms can just be a source of infection. This is an image of a bacterial biofilm of Staphylococcus. Now, I want you to take a look at this, kind of interesting. You know, it, it looks like this, to me it almost looks like uh, somebody's, uh, now like, like taffy, <clears throat> like taffy candy. And we've got these bacteria that are embedded in this biofilm. And if you can imagine, it's almost like a freeway, you know, where let's say a bacteria up in this upper right-hand corner can now communicate with a bacteria down in this, in this lower left-hand corner. 
So it's a way that bacteria and yeast can share information, but they also use this biofilm as a defense mechanism. Uh, it's much more difficult for the immune system to find its way and weave itself through this sort of this taffy-like um, polymatrix structure. Um, so the biofilms are a defense mechanism that the yeast and bacteria use um, to defend itself from the immune system. And this is a perfect example. We've got a picture here on the left of you know um, yeast becoming invasive, and then we've got invasive yeast that are in, essentially embedded in this film of or this biofilm, <clears throat> and uh, quite problematic. So you can see many times that you know w this could be one reason why some kids have ongoing problems with yeast and bacteria is that you could be throwing everything at it from an antibiotic to a <clears throat> to a, um, an antifungal to all kinds of herbs, etc and it just can't get through to some of these deeper layers of these biofilms. <clears throat> okay, let's touch a little bit on nystatin versus diflucan. Okay, nystatin is a very effective antifungal medication, okay, anti-yeast specifically with respects to candida. And what it does is it essentially inhibits the way candida um, utilizes cholesterol with a chemical equivalent to cholesterol to help build its own cell membrane. Um, it also forms holes in the cell membrane that bas basically allow for that candida to leak potassium uh, and that can lead to the candida dying off. Okay, Nystatin has been around for a long time. Um, it's, a, it's a medication that does not get absorbed to any significant degree through the digestive tract. So you think of it, nystatin, as a local antifungal that coats the inner lining of the digestive tract um, and sort of like paints the inner lining of the digestive tract to get those surface level yeast that exist in the gut. I think of nystatin like Pepto-Bismol. Pepto-Bismol coats the stomach, nystatin coats the intestinal system. Okay, um, And with that, because it doesn't get absorbed to any significant degree, in my experience, it can be taken at very large amounts for prolonged periods of time without really the need to do any type of blood testing, liver testing, kidney testing, etc. Okay, So <clears throat> I've used nystatin in some kids for years because their bodies just are dependent on nystatin to keep the yeast in check. Now I give a typical dosing here of 100,000 to 250,000 per ml, but those doses could, get, could many times go even higher. Okay, so we could be looking at 500,000, 750,000, a million, 1.5 million um, um, units of nystatin per dose. Many times dose three times a day up to sometimes four times a day. I usually in my practice prescribe it three times a day because I realize that trying to dose something four times a day is um, very, very difficult. So again, nystatin is um, an effective antifungal, can be taken for long periods of time. Now, diflucan. Let's go to the next one here. Diflucan, along with something called Nizorol, Spornox, Lamisil, are systemic antifungals. Okay? And these tend to inhibit um, chemicals in the body um, that essentially the yeast use to build their cell membranes. This ergosterol is a cholesterol type derivative that they use to build their cell their cell walls. So essentially diflucan works in a little bit different way than nystatin does. Um, <clears throat> but the whole point here is that the diflucan, nizorol, spornox, lamisil are systemic, which means they get absorbed from the digestive tract within a couple hours and they can have an effect throughout the body um, and more so than say nystatin will. Okay? So what I've seen in my practice is you're usually looking at things of like diflucan for, well, this is a reason why diflucan many times is used for women with vaginal yeast infections. Nystatin's not going to get absorbed, so it's not going to have an effect in the vaginal area. Diflucan can. Nizorol can have an effect on fungus on the skin. Lamisil and Sporinox many times are used for toenail fungus. It has to get into the bloodstream so that it can have a peripheral effect somewhere else um, other than just the gut. A lot of people are concerned about long-term use of diflucan or nizorol or whatnot because of the potential for liver enzyme problems. And that is a valid um, concern. Okay, These things can be stressful on the liver. Uh, in my experience, nizorol, spornox, lamisil, probably in that order, 
um, would be more stressful on the liver than, say, diflucan. But ideally, you know, before some of these medications are used, um, for considering for prolonged purposes, <clears throat> prolonged could be you know, two months, four months, six months, you know, baseline blood work should be done to look at your child's liver function. And then every four to eight weeks or so, on average six weeks, you know, blood testing should be done again to make sure that those liver enzymes aren't going up and that there's not some type of stress. Now, in my practice, um, have I seen liver enzymes elevate? I have on occasion, although it's very rare. And, you know, in my experience with the hundreds and hundreds of kids I've treated, I've actually used Diflucan for, for prolonged periods of time without issue. And I just don't see the liver problems that, um, that are reported, although I do check blood tests. So it is a good thing to do. But I just want you to be aware, if you're, if, if you're a physician out there listening to this, um, you really can move forward with confidence in using something like Diflucan, um, even for prolonged periods of time in kids. And you, very, very rarely will you see a liver enzyme issue. If you do, you take them off. Usually it's resolved within two to four weeks, and you can initiate therapy again. The dosing of Diflucan, um, you know, the literature kind of indicates anywhere between three to six milligrams. I usually do a five milligram per kilogram dose per day um, on average, and, and that seems to work pretty well. <clears throat> All right, methylation. Methylation is a very important biochemical um, pathway in the body or chemical process in the body. We can't survive without it. It really is at the cornerstone of biomedical intervention for, for autism. If you start looking at um, the biochemical imbalances that kids have, it really falls at the feet of methylation defects. It's a very complicated biochemical system to understand. I'm not going to go into it all in depth tonight. Um, I have a, an entire presentation that I've done in the past and I can certainly do in the future that talks about methylation chemistry, but I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor for this and just maybe kind of clear up a little bit of confusion that happens when people are talking about methylation issues. We know that methylation um, has a, a very important function over the in, entire aspects of our body, you know, from everything from controlling our immune system um, to helping our body you know, fight off infections from viruses to bacteria to yeast to the way our brain is developed to the way the myelin is preserved um, in the brain, which helps with the electrical conductivity between nerve cells. It has a, an influence on glutathione production, which is a very powerful antioxidant that many kids are deficient in. Um, <clears throat> it has direct effects on cell membrane function in the brain that, that have an effect on attention and focusing eye contact, sometimes language development can be tied to methylation problems. So it, it has its hands in many, many things that we talk about with respect to kids and the therapies that we use to try to intervene. Now, the, and you've probably seen these types of charts before, and they get obviously you know make your head spin when you try to look at this. But the bottom line here is that this is the folate um, transulfuration methylation cycle, OK? Um, big words, but the bottom line here is that this is an area that for many of your kids um, is where things are a problem. And why it's so complicated is that um, no, kids are too, no two kids are exactly alike, so none of them really respond to <clears throat> all the therapies we have with the same intensity, with the same types of benefits, or sometimes even the same side effects. It's because, you know, these are you know, this is a, a graphic representation of a very dynamic system that's tied to everything in our body, okay? And so, you know, just by trying to give one supplement and move it from point A to point B doesn't always mean that there's not going to be some other influence in the body. But when we're talking about methylation defects particularly, and we're specifically talking about supplement intervention, um, we're really talking about this area where the X is, okay? And this X is a blocking point through the normal chemical sequencing of what's called methylation, which is where we're moving homocysteine to methionine. Um, it also has an influence on folic acid or folate metabolism. Um, and downstream, it can have an effect on what's called transulfuration chemistry, the end result being glutathione production, which is necessary for detoxification and um, as an antioxidant. Okay, let's move forward from here. <clears throat> Um, for those of you who don't know 
Dr. Newbrander, I would recommend you get familiar with his work. You can go to his website at drnewbrander.com. He's uh, considered to be the father of methyl B12 therapy for autism-related disorders. His website is a, a load of information from downloadable articles to videos. Um, I, I use his material quite a bit. And as I mentioned before, if any of you came on late, uh, I just recently wrote a book about methyl B12 therapy, specifically methyl B12 injection therapy. Um, and I think if you read this book, you'll understand why this therapy is so important and different aspects of how to implement it. Um, but methyl B12 for autism .com, um, so has more information about that book. Think of this book as a guidebook on how to implement methyl B12 injection therapy. And so methyl B12 is very, very important. And we're going to talk a little bit later about detoxification uh, and heavy metal toxicity. But we know that methyl B12 or just methylation support has huge benefits with respect to supporting mental processing, to higher cognitive awareness, to attention focusing awareness, language expression development, um, as well as just kids becoming more social and personally aware of themselves in their own world. <clears throat> some of you are probably doing B12, some of you maybe not. Um, you, if you've heard me talk before, you know that I'm a big fan of the injection form of B12. As you can see here, this is a syringe of methyl B12 pre-filled of a child about 40 pounds. This is about 1,250 micrograms of methyl B12. As you can see, the needle is very, very small, uh, even just compared to uh, a typical pencil. Um, it's a very, very um, simple therapy to implement. I don't want to say it's always easy because I realize that there can be some anxiety and fear around this. But if you hadn't ever seen a, a picture before of methyl B12, the syringe, you realize it's actually very, very small. Okay. And there are specific areas that we're injecting it. Okay. A lot of times people have asked me, do I, can I inject the methyl B12 in some other place in the body? What about the arm, the back of the shoulder, you know, wherever? And I say, really, the ideal place that has been determined clinically is in that upper outer quadrant area of the buttocks. And the reason is, is the fat in the butt is metabolically different than any fat elsewhere in the body. And so we're looking for that slow release effect, that more consistent blood level release effect of methyl B12. Periodically, you know, some people may give a shot lower down in the buttocks area, and that's fine, but I would really kind of confine the shot to this particular area. You'll find that you're going to get more consistent results in doing so. <clears throat> okay. Well, I get often asked, what about other forms of B12? Um, the bottom line here is that methyl B12 is beneficial um, for a, a wide variety of kids. In my clinical experience, the methyl B12 injection is the most clinically effective <clears throat> when you compare it to taking it orally, trying to do a powder, trying to do it as a cream, trying to do it as a nasal spray, and then, you know, of course, there's the new lollipop that's out that um, is relatively new. It, it has a fair amount of methyl B12 in it, but there's just not any, you know, real studies at this point to, to compare the differences um, or to compare these. It really is based more on just our clinical experience. And, you know, I've looked at positive results from the, from the injection to the nasal spray to the oral, and, to, and from my experience, there really is no different. I mean, there's, there's no comparison. The injection form is the most consistent form of, of a way of administering B12. Now, I realize sometimes there's difficulty in giving the injection, and some kids are very, very fearful or difficult to give it to, and, and so a nasal spray may be an option. Um, to me, that's fine. The nasal spray certainly is an option. And then, of course, in some kids, you know, um, you know, the lollipop may be a good option too. But if I'm looking to start this therapy, personally myself, I'm looking to start the injection therapy <clears throat> because I want I, I want to see those those clinical results and the consistent results because if we're going to do methyl B12 therapy, we might as well try to use what we know clinically to be most successful. Okay, this was a, a small graph chart uh, study that was done just on you know blood levels with respects to different forms of B12. They weren't looking at at that time that this was done to the lollipop version, uh, but they did look at two different oral concentrations of methyl B12 and they looked at it over a you know, a certain hour period of time. They looked at the nasal spray, and they looked at the subcutaneous. As you can see, the subcutaneous route came the highest, um, and then the nasal spray versions um, tended to 
they get fairly high, but then they tend to drop off pretty quickly. And that's what I've seen clinically in my practice is when you're doing the nasal spray, it generally needs to be given more frequently um, as opposed to the injections, which usually to start is done every three days. <clears throat> and But I do need to touch just a little bit on the nasal spray. Um, generally, the nasal spray is something that you, you have to get through a prescription. However, New Beginnings does carry methyl mate, which is an oral form of, of methyl B12. And if you request the nasal applicator, they can send you the nasal applicator and you can convert the methyl B12 uh, oral into a nasal spray. And one spray is approximately 500 micrograms of methyl B12. And the general recommendation, it's a little bit, it doesn't always match up to the injection. We can pretty much take weight pretty easily and figure out how much we need for the injection. That's been worked out pretty well. It's a little bit, um, the dosing of the of the nasal spray is a little bit more uh, not as rigid, I guess you could say, um, and so you're kind of having to play around with the doses a little bit more. For adults, you know, I generally recommend anywhere between one to four sprays each nostril, one to two times per day. Okay, again, my philosophy of dosing things when it's coming to new supplements or whatnot is start low, start slow, and build up. Okay, and kids, you know, usually one to two sprays per day, sometimes every other day. I've had parents who come and said, hey, they give the spray, you know, a couple times a day, and that's fine, okay. Uh, but just realize that when it comes to oral, nasal, um, transdermal, powder, lollipop, you know, the dosing and the way to do it is not as specific um, as we, the information that we have with the injections. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the methylation cycle, okay? <clears throat> and as you can see, there's there's a lot of different areas that we can intervene. There are other products that can be used to support the methylation cycle, and one of them is DMG. DMG stands for dimethylglycine. This is a particular product you can get from New Beginnings. It comes as a 125 milligram tablet. They're very small. They actually taste very sweet, so they're actually very easy to give. Again, the dosage of this hasn't been worked out as sort of clinically and scientifically as the, the, the injection of methyl B12. So again, start low, start slow, and build up. Um, but usually anywhere between one to six tablets daily, on average for most kids, you know, three, four, five, six years old, um, seven year, years old, you might be using anywhere between two to three per day. And, you know, the benefits that you're looking for with something like this is you know, um, improved speech, better attention, better focusing, less hyperactivity, less irritability. <clears throat> now, DMG is actually derived from TMG, and one of the unique things about DMG is it has an influence over folic acid metabolism, or what's called folate metabolism. And we know that folates will actually help to what's called methylate, which means it transfers its methyl group this uh, this carbon and with three hydrogen uh, group to cobalamin, which is the cobalamin becomes methylated um, within that methionine synthase enzyme complex, and it kind of keeps the ball rolling, if you will. Okay, that methionine synthase I'll show you again here is where I had that X. That was an area that's biochemically vulnerable in many kids, and it's also an area that is. Um, very active with respects to attention. Okay, so we know that DMG methyl B12 can be effective in helping with kids' attention. I wish it was effective 100% of the time, but it's one of those things that can be helpful for that. Okay, and as I mentioned before, the X. And I want you to just take a quick look here. We have homocysteine. Okay, homocysteine is pulled upwards in from you know six o'clock to twelve o'clock to become methionine. As methionine comes down the backside to 6 o'clock again, you get all these other types of biochemical influences. I won't go into all that tonight. But, it, but just take a look at this real quickly and understand that, that Mother Nature knew that this biochemical system was very important for our overall health. Okay? And it was so important that she created two pathways so that there was a backup mechanism to make sure that we got to methionine. We have the one primary route, which goes through methionine synthase, okay, where this MS stands for, um, <clears throat> and that has an influence on folates, okay, or folic acid, which then flows through this other complicated biochemical system here and has an influence on other aspects of the body, particularly um, 
gene sequencing and function of the nucleus of the cell with respects to DNA and RNA, which have a control over how proteins are made in our body and how the DNA function, all right? Well, she also created a, a mechanism here where we peel off homocysteine to methionine just through this secondary pathway, okay? And this is where we're converting TNG, which is betaine, to dimethylglycine. So she created a, a, a basically a pathway, um, uh, two pathways to essentially reach the same thing, okay? So if we have a problem in one area, we can keep this system moving forward with a backup mechanism. Now, TMG, um, is its primary function is to take homocysteine and methionine. And the reason that's important, you won't find too many kids on the spectrum that have elevated homocysteine, but every once in a while you will. Um, it's something that's more common in adults, and homocysteine by itself can be an independent risk factor for heart disease. Okay, this is why they, you know if you find elevated homocysteine, they're usually giving you, you know, B6 and folic acid and B12. All right, <clears throat> so TMG is something that also helps in this methylation cycle. Now TMG is pretty powerful by itself. So you know it's all about a balance, right? We're all we're trying to keep a balance with all these biochemical systems, and uh, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it isn't. And so the general recommendation if you're using TMG is that you support initially with a little bit of taurine. And the reason for that, let me see if I can find another slide. Um, let me go back real quick. The reason is, this is not the best slide here, but we have TMG, which is on this slide is betaine, okay? Um, we don't have taurine down here, but we have cysteine, and cysteine becomes glutathione. Well, glutathione we know is that is that antioxidant within our cells. It helps protect our cells against toxicity. And glutathione is also that thing that helps to flush our cells of toxins too. Many kids are deficient in glutathione. So if we're pulling on too much homocysteine here, you can end up causing a depletion effect through this downward cycle where you may start to run a bit of a deficit on cysteine and affect glutathione production. So even though these methylating supplements are great, you can sometimes pull too much in one direction and create imbalances. <clears throat> so the general recommendation is, is to use a little bit of taurine as a stopgap to try to, you know, because taurine is a sulfur-based amino acid, and it's just to kind of prevent that the, uh, the sink from draining too quickly at the bottom, okay? So TMG needs to be balanced many times a little bit with taurine. Now, <clears throat> a couple things about TMG. In my experience, if you're using methyl B12, you've got to be careful with using TMG because you can pull too much on homocysteine and create chemical imbalances elsewhere. Um, and just some kids become way overstimulated um, by using that combination. Usually, you can get away with methyl B12 and sometimes DMG, um, but in many cases, the TNG plus methyl B12 is, is not a real good combination. I, I would certainly never start with, with that combination, okay? And then, of course, we have the folates. And there's, again, there's some confusion about folates because we have folate, folic acid, folinic acid, you know, tetrahydrofolate, etc. Well, folates in general are derived from green leafy vegetables, grains, beans, etc. And even yeast and bacteria can, can create um, folate. So things like a nutritional yeast, for example, will be something that creates folates. What folates do essentially is they, they transfer that methyl group, that carbon and three hydrogens, to that cobalamin within that enzyme complex we talked about called methionine synthase. So it keeps that cycle moving. Okay, And then it has an influence, again, on um, the nucleus of the cell and, and these things called purines, um, pyrimidines. <clears throat> it appears that folinic acid, which is a uh, 5-formal tetrahydrofolate, big fancy word, basically folinic acid, seems to be the most versatile form of, of folate for kids on the spectrum because of where it works, how it works, and some of the other unique biochemical things going on um, with, with your kids, and that just straight folic acid, F-O-L-I-C, um, could be more problematic. Okay, so what I generally do in, in my practice is I use, uh, I tend to use folinic acid as a way to add additional folate support for um, 
this biochemical influence that we're trying to have with respects to attention and focusing and hyperactivity and immune function, etc. Okay, so in the future when I do, I'll, I'll do a presentation that's very more specifically tied to the methylation cycle. Um, you'll understand this a little bit more. I wanted to put this in there because I get this question asked quite a bit, you know, what's the difference between, you know, folic acid and folate, folinic acid, and which one should I use? Because the bottom line, right, for you, for you folks is, okay, doc, great, interesting biochemistry, but what do I use? You know, what should I get? And generally, I tend to use a lot of the folinic acid from New Beginnings. It comes as a 400 microgram um, capsule, and I'll use for most kids anywhere between 400 to 800 micrograms uh, per day, um, and it seems to work pretty well. I, a lot of times we'll think of folinic acid in kids who are tending to have some hyperactivity issues that are a little bit prolonged when we're using methyl B12. Um, there's actually um, some evidence that you can use very high dose folinic acid um, as an antidepressant. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk here a little bit about the immune system. Again, a very in-depth topic um, causes a lot of confusion for people, and deservedly so, um, because it is a it is a very complex thing to consider. What we're going to touch on that I think comes up most often for you is when you're looking at some of the testing, um, <clears throat> and that has to do with these antibodies, you know, these immunoglobulins. And we have, and the reason this is important is because, you know, you may be doing, let's say, a, a viral panel, or you're checking your child for titers, what are called titers to vaccines, or you've done an IgG food allergy test or uh, food sensitivity test, or you've done an immune deficiency panel to see if there's any type of immune deficiency. Uh, maybe your child is doing, has done, or you're considering IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. Anyway. What we're talking about is we're talking about one arm of the immune system because the immune system is obviously very complex. It's 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 positioned itself in multiple areas of the body, and uh, but this is something that causes a lot of confusion and people have questions about. Take for example the food IgG profile. What you're looking at is IgG. IgG is the most abundant antibody in the bloodstream. <clears throat> okay. Um, we can do a lot of testing on IgG to various things. You can look at IgG reactions to foods. You can look at IgG reactions to bacteria or viruses or uh, vaccine reactions, etc. Because it is the long-term response. It gives. It's a memory marker of past exposure um, to whether it's food reactions or infections. When we're looking at IgA and IgM, it gets a little bit different. <clears throat> now, your child could have a deficiency in any one of these. They could have a deficiency in IgM, IgA, IgG. <clears throat> How I always think about these antibodies is use the military as an example. When our body first engages an antibody, the first antibody that gets produced is IgM. And IgM is the Marines. The Marines are your first responders. These are the guys that hit the beachhead first. Okay, They go in for the initial attack. Many times they will bring an auxiliary force along with them, the IgA, to assist in that invasion. Once the beachhead or once that battle area has been neutralized in some respects, you then get your major ground forces move in, which is the IgG, to give you long-term um, support. Okay. Now, in the bloodstream, that's a typical scenario. In the digestive system, because the digestive system is a little bit different from an immune system standpoint, remember the most abundant immune chemical in the gut was IgA, what's called secretory IgA. However, it's, it's not well recognized or it's usually never talked about, but still in the gut, the first thing, the antibody that gets produced is IgM. Okay, so you still kind of have that same scenario in the digestive tract. IgM tends to be the first thing produced, but it's just not produced in huge amounts. We're, we're primarily dealing with IgA in the gut. So basically, the IgA is the primary immune activator within the digestive system. So we have 
Long term, we have initial acute reactions, which can last you know anywhere for, for a couple of weeks, so the IgMs will then start to go away. Or the IgG, which can come on a couple of weeks later and stay elevated in some cases for years. Now, when we're talking about the digestive tract, as I mentioned, IgA in the bloodstream is produced at a very low amount, but it's actually taken down into the digestive tract, secreted across the cells of the digestive tract, and then pushed out into that mucus layer, and then therefore it becomes secretory IgA. So it's being secreted into the mucus layer. And that mucus layer is your eyes, your nose, your throat, your upper part of your respiratory tree, your entire digestive system, the, the vagina in women, the urethra in both men and women, um, as well as the bladder. Okay, this is sort of that internal skin surface, if you will, that secretory IgA is having a control over. <clears throat> Now, secretory IgA, as I mentioned here, is, is lining all of these internal surfaces, um, and it is the largest immune organ in the body. So the secretory IgA lining the gut is really the first line of immune defense for our entire immune system, short of our skin. <clears throat> and it helps to neutralize against a wide variety of different things, everything from bacterial infections to viruses to candida to parasites and food sensitivities. And so when there are sta long-standing problems in balances, whether it's chronic stress in the gut, chronic inflammation, um, depletion of the mucosal layer, secretory IgA can be compromised. And when, the comp when secretory IgA is compromised long-term, it can just lead to an increased susceptibility to food sensitivities, to yeast, to bacteria, um, and just chronic, chronic infections. <clears throat> By the way, probiotics, which, you know, the things like the bifidobacter, the acidophilus, et cetera, are something that naturally helps to stimulate the secretory IgA, IgA to be produced in the gut. So the one thing about this is that the secretory IgA is the main immune regulator over local infect, excuse me, local immunity within the digestive tract, but it also has um, a switching mechanism over what I, what, what's called systemic immunity throughout the body. So when we really talk about biomedicine, right, we go back and, and start looking about what are some things that we can do to help with the digestive system um, because the gut is really the, the main, it's the physical window of the body, it's where we absorb um, our nutrients, but it's also the major route that we get rid of toxins, but it's also the, the largest immune organ in our body and it has a direct effect over uh, immunity throughout our body. So, it, you know, our gut can be our Achilles heel or it can be the saving grace that actually allows us to get healthy. <clears throat> so I always think of, you know, um, gut physiology and gut function and chronic yeast and et cetera um, as a place to help remedy what we're dealing with not only locally within the digestive tract but systemically with respects to kids on the spectrum because their brain, their nervous system is very much tied to what's going on in their digestive tract, um, both neurologically um, as well as immunologically. Let's finish up here on, because <clears throat> we're um, probably going to be about an hour and a half presentation here. Um, let's finish up just touching a little bit on heavy metal toxicity, okay? Well, we know that heavy metal toxicity is a big topic in autism, autism spectrum disorders, um, and we know it's been around for a long time and it will continue to be so because it truly is an issue. We know that mercury is a problem, lead, etc., and other metals um, and in combination are an issue for many kids. <clears throat> what are some things to just remember and consider about heavy metal and heavy metal toxicity? A lot of people have concern or are confused between the difference of what's called chelation therapy and what is called heavy metal detox or detoxification therapy. Let me just state right here that detoxification is a normal physiological process of our body. Okay, our body is designed to metabolize nutrients from our food, from our water, okay, to help fuel energy production to make our body work from our heart to our lungs to to our brain to you know our joints. But we have to have a way of getting rid of those byproducts. It's like putting gas in the in your car, it has to, it comes out as exhaust, okay? But it makes your car run. Well, detoxification pathways in our body is what does that. 
from a large scale, the kidney, the gut, the skin, and your breath are detoxification processes. Okay, you breathe out carbon dioxide, which is a uh, a byproduct of oxygen metabolism. You sweat as a way to um, regulate body temperature, but you can also get rid of chemical toxins in the body through sweat. You basically are excreting toxins and metabolic byproducts of metabolism through your kidney. You're getting rid of toxins that you've either come in through your through your gut, through food, air, or water, as well as metabolic toxins that are metabolized through the liver. Okay, so detoxification is a normal pathway. What you're doing with respect to diet, to supplements, to treating yeast, to treating bacteria, to giving methyl B12, to doing glutathione, to whatever you're doing from a biomedical standpoint, in essence, is supporting your child's detoxification pathways. Okay, it's not chelation therapy specifically, but you're supporting detox. So everything you're doing, in essence, is supporting their body's ability to detoxify toxins um, and, and to improve their body's metabolic efficiency at cleansing the cells and cleansing their body of whatever they come in contact with. <clears throat> Heavy metal detox is a specific therapy. Okay, Chelation therapy is a specific therapy. And Technically, heavy metal detox could be considered chelation therapy, but it depends on what you're using to do it. Okay, and let me go through this real quickly. Heavy metal detox is a medically approved therapy for heavy metal poisoning. Okay, whether it's mercury, lead, arsenic, cadmium, tin, or a combination of all of those. Um, <clears throat> it's been used all over the world specifically for heavy metal toxicity. There is no other treatment for heavy metal toxicity than heavy metal detoxification therapy. So, you know, the, the reality is is that heavy metal toxicity is a real condition. It's a proven medical condition. Um, and you just look up oh, any medical textbook, they may not recognize it as a problem for a large percentage of the population, but it's a reality. They know that lead toxicity, mercury toxicity, arsenic toxicity happen. So there has to be a way to deal with it from a treatment standpoint. Okay. Question comes up, is heavy metal detox a, a safe therapy? Well, any drug that's used um, can have a potential for toxicity or a potential for an adverse reaction. <clears throat> any antibiotic, any heart medication, any skin cream you use may have. Now, certainly there are drugs that are higher risk for toxicity um, and allergic sensitivities. I mean, obviously, chemotherapy drugs are, um, can be toxic. Um, you know, certain medications that, that, that suppress, you know, autoimmune problems in the body can certainly be toxic. But not every drug carries the same level of toxicity or, um, or concern. But any patient, any person can have a potential for an allergic reaction to anything you give them, whether it's a drug, amoxicillin, or an anti-yeast, or a cancer drug, or a supplement. Okay, so those, those potentials are out there. The question is, is, is the presence of heavy metals in the body um, a safe thing? Okay, is just having heavy metals in the body a problem? <clears throat> and certainly you can make the case that, yeah, it is a problem, okay? Um, are you, is your child ever going to be 100% heavy metal free? No, because there's heavy metals in our environment. There's heavy metals that we're exposed to um, all the time, not necessarily in large amounts, but you know, we live in a world where these things are around us. <clears throat> so there's always going to be some level uh, in your child's body. But you know, are they toxic from it? Is it a, is it a real problem? Okay. The one other thing, too, is that I've seen in the newspapers, the media catches on to this, is that heavy metal detox is not just a specific treatment for autism. Not any more than heavy metal detox is a specific treatment for heart disease, cancer, or diabetes. Heavy metal detox is a specific treatment for heavy metal poisoning, regardless of the diagnosis. So it may be something that you do in a patient with cancer or heart disease or an autoimmune problem or a, or a child on the spectrum. Um, as a way, as a means to try to improve their health, improve their immune system, improve their neurological function, but it shouldn't be viewed as a specific treatment for autism. <clears throat> okay, it just so happens that, as biomedical doctors, that's the that makes up the bulk of our patients, and so we're using it as a way to just improve a child's medical condition, obviously with the hope that it helps their autistic condition. Okay, so think about it. You know, and I kind of. This, this slide sort of self-explanatory. Um, if you have heavy metal toxicity, if you had an, a patient with Alzheimer's or had chronic fatigue or multiple sclerosis and they had 
elevated levels of lead, I mean, to me, the most medically appropriate thing to do is to try to do something about the lead levels. Um, am I specifically treating their Alzheimer's or am I specifically treating multiple sclerosis? No, I'm just trying to get their lead levels down. But if their multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's or chronic fatigue gets better in the process, um, that's terrific, okay? If a child's autism improves by <clears throat> doing, you know, lead detox or mercury detox, then that's great, okay? Um, none of us can make a guarantee that's going to happen 100%, but it is one of those things that, as a biomedical therapy, is helpful for a large percentage of kids, okay? And so this sort of sheds that, you know, no, no treatment is 100% foolproof. Um, none of these therapies are 100% foolproof. None of them work 100%, 100% of the time for, for all the kids. Um, but what we're doing is we're trying to implement these therapies from diet to supplements to yeast treatment to detox to, to methyl B12 therapy um, as a way to try to um, have a, a synergistic effect on, you know, your child's overall medical condition so that their body functions better, so that they have a better chance of um, Im improvement and recovery, and uh, the more things you many times you can do um, like this to just support detox and whatnot can be helpful, okay? So what about testing, okay? Because testing comes up a lot, and this is another area that causes a lot of confusion. You know, is there one test that you can do to, to, to rule in or rule out metal toxicity? Um, unfortunately, there's not, okay? There's not one test that you can do that says, I need to detox and I don't need to detox um, <clears throat> with respects to heavy metals. The porphyrin profile is helpful, but it's not always 100% foolproof, okay? What I tend to do in my practice as a baseline is I'll run a hair test because a hair test gives an indication of exposure and there are some indicators in the mineral part of the hair test that might be might be indicative of a mineral imbalance from heavy metals. It certainly gives you an idea of exposure, gives you an idea of sort of what's coming out in the hair, but none of these tests tell you how much metal is being left behind in the body. But a hair test is, is uh, inexpensive and generally easy to get. The porphyrin test is a urine analysis, and <clears throat> you can actually get the porphyrin test from, from Great Plains. Um, some people order the porphyrin test from the uh, French lab, uh, I think it's labio.net, um, L-A-B-B-I-O.net, I think it's .net or .com. Um, but what porphyrins are, are, porphyrins are, they are a chemical process that the end result makes something called heme, and heme makes hemoglobin, which carries oxygen through the body. Heme is also involved in the liver for detoxification, has some other functions too. So there are certain genetic uh, diseases that can cause heme imbalances, pretty rare, um, but we know that certain metals can interfere with porphyrin metabolism as well. The porphyrin test to me has always uh, been an indicator of metal toxicity or the cellular effect of metal exposure, but just because a porphyrin test is normal doesn't mean that your child doesn't have some heavy metals in their body or that they haven't been exposed, okay? We then also have fecal tests. To me, fecal tests have always been something that's used um, as a way to assess for exposure. They're pretty good to pick up on things that your child may be currently getting exposed to, whether it's lead or mercury through food or water. Um, I don't generally tend to use fecal metal tests as a long-term tool of measuring metal detox, although I have a few patients that do that, but we have a long track record of doing that. But a fecal metal test is usually something I'll do up front to just assess for environmental exposures. And I had a, a situation in, uh, somebody was in Arizona, they lived in a new community that was built on old cotton farms, and uh, it turned out that there was high lead and high arsenic. And, um, you know, we know that arsenic is used as an herbicide and pesticides, which they were at that time spraying on the cotton farms. Urine testing is something we use many times as a way to measure for excretion rates of heavy metals. About 99% of the time, if you just do a, a baseline urine test, you won't see a whole lot of urine coming out of your child just at any one time, unless they've had a, a high, a recent exposure or something. But you may see urine come out if you do what's called a challenge, which is where you take a certain chelating agent, and I'll talk about that in a second, that causes an excretion, a certain percentage of excretion of stored metal in the body. And so you many times will do a pre and a post urine test to look for the differences of excretion. 
Okay, again, a urine test only gives you an indication of what's coming out at one time. It doesn't tell you how much is left behind in the body. But when you use these tests um, in sequence and you put the information together, it does give you good clinical information with respect to um, what may be the best way to proceed with, with detox, um, <clears throat> how long you might have to do detox, which is somewhat of an unknown, um, and whether it makes sense to do it. About 80% of the time, these metal tests are they give good information to say, yeah, it makes sense to implement heavy metal detox therapy. About 20% of the time, they come back inconclusive, so you're still left up to clinical judgment to do so. So you have to take in the clinical history of your child um, from their exposures to the, to the problems that you see um, of whether it makes sense to do it, okay? <clears throat> I know it's a, a, a lot of information to take in. Well, what what then do we use? Okay, and this again would be a topic for you know just a specific topic on detox, but there are a wide variety of different agents. DMSA, DMPS, and calcium EDTA. These are what are considered to be typical chelating agents. Now the word chelation or chely um, means claw. And basically what's happening is, is this, it's a chemical word that means claw, which means that there is a claw-like bonding configuration happening between the agent and some type of mineral or metal, okay? That's essentially all it is. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a specific type of chemical bond, and it's called chelation. If you've noticed, you probably have some supplements that are called chelated minerals, and it's because the minerals are bound in a specific chelation claw-like configuration, okay? The, the New Beginnings has a product called Chelate Mate, and Chelate Mate has nothing to do with chelation therapy. It just has to do with the fact that the minerals are bound in a specific way. <clears throat> so chelation therapy is generally specific. That term is generally specific for the use of DMSA, DMPS, or EDTA. Now, those agents may not necessarily technically, from a pure chemist standpoint, bind in the exact claw-like configuration. But just you know, for, for your own information here, chelation is generally um, oriented to the use of DMSA, DMPS, and EDTA, okay, <clears throat> as the as the agent of choice. So chelation therapy is heavy metal detoxification. Okay, um, the word sounds scary. It sounds like chemotherapy. So in some respects, they probably should change the name, but, but it probably won't be. Okay, because it's it's a word used in, in uh, chemistry. However, you theoretically can do heavy metal detox with other agents, okay, and this is where some of the natural agents come into play, and people ask me all the time, you know, what about NDF or zeolite or um, metal free, what are those, can those do chelation, and, I, and my, my answer is, is, you know, it's possible that those can have a supportive effect on helping to remove certain levels of heavy metals. Um, it's pretty difficult to know for sure you know, how much they remove at any one time, because whenever you do urine testing to sort of indicate how much metal is coming out, usually the levels are not that high. So most of the time those remedies fall into the category of, uh, you know, couldn't hurt, uh, could help, maybe worth a try, um, or they can be used as supportive therapy along with the traditional chelators. But if you're going to be using a remedy like that, they're technically not called chelation. A lot of times they'll say natural chelation. That's, but, I mean, technically we should be re, we, uh, um, using chelation therapy specifically for the use of DMSA, DMPS, and EDTA, okay? <clears throat> now, when we talk about efficiency of chelation therapy let's uh, for the use of DMSA, DMPS, DTA, we have oral suppository, intravenous, and transdermal. In my experience, the most direct way of getting these chelators into the body is IV, okay? Um, not always easy to do. It's not always readily available, but that is the most, I think you'd say, efficient because it goes straight in and you're not getting any sort of interference with having to, you know, do a suppository or trying to absorb some things from the digestive tract. The most common form of chelation that's done through the use of these remedies is oral. Now, oral DMSA, oral DMPS, um, which tend to be absorbed fairly well. EDTA is not absorbed real well orally, so it's not really used that much um, orally, but it is used uh, a lot 
IV. And then you have suppository, and suppositories are available for all of those things as well, and that works pretty well. The transdermal, from my experience, has never really worked all that well, um, and you don't really see it being used too much anymore. So <clears throat> I know there's probably a lot of questions out there about, you know, this product or, you know, that product or how it's done. And this top, this presentation isn't so much to go into all the nitty gritty about detox therapy. Um, it, it is a, a, a real a presentation all by itself. But my main point here, as I wanted to point out, is that, you know, technically there is a difference between chelation therapy, which is using a specific agent, a specific medication that binds to something in a specific way, versus just detoxification, which is, you know, mediated from everything you do biomedically, from supplements to yeast support to diet to methyl B12 to heavy metal detox, which could be accomplished many times with things even like glutathione, because that helps to remove heavy metals, but it's not technically a chelator, okay? <clears throat> All right, and just to follow up, if you came on late, I just want to give you a quick rundown. Um, we're coming on actually a year anniversary of our biomedical website called Autism Action Plan, and, you know, if you're wanting more assistance, if you're wanting to communicate with me more, maybe you have a Dan doctor you're working with, but, um, you know, you want to have another doctor where you can kind of, uh, you know, bounce some questions off of or, you know, have me, you know, look at something from a standpoint of a particular product you're using or just other kind of information you're, you're seeking, I'm available for that. And as I mentioned before, you know, the Autism Action Plan site is a membership site, but I'm actively involved in this on a day-to-day -day basis. We have an act, a 12-week a, an act, action plan for people who are just starting, you know, getting going and implementing the diet and supplements. We have um, these live video chats where Don Winkleman, the speech and feeding therapist, does one once a week. I'm on this twice a week, you know, basically answering your questions live through the computer. Um, no other technology is needed, uh, and that's a real neat service. And uh, that's that's a real popular thing that we do. And then this very active parent forum where, you know, people talk to me about their kids. They may be a patient of mine. They may be working with another doctor. They may not have a doctor in their area. And they're just using me as a resource. So, you know, it, just being able to extend myself to you from that standpoint is a real pleasure because it's, it's all about education. The more confident you become in these things, the more familiar you are with the, the terminology, the more uh, able you are to help your child. And that's ultimately the goal. <clears throat> if you want to find out more about our website, there's actually a, a demo on the home page. You can link to it through uh, Great Plains' website. There's a link off their home page here, okay? And, uh, you know, take it from there. So <clears throat> just to kind of let you know, um, because I tend to go pretty long in these presentations, I don't take questions anymore. Through these, uh, through these webinar. If you've typed in a question tonight, those questions will be forwarded um, to Great Plains and they will eventually forward them to me and I'll be able to answer uh, some of those questions for you, um, at least from what you typed in. But uh, again, if you're wanting more you know, in-depth um, interaction with me, the Action Plan website is a, is a great place for that. So everybody, I hope this was informative for you. I know there's a lot of information. I know I wasn't able to cover all the different aspects, you know, of definitions and terminologies and biomedical concepts, but hopefully you found it helpful and uh, look forward to uh, our next presentation next month and uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, take care.